I'm going to speak today about fidelity of quantum uh, uh, repeat, automatic repeat request protocol, or you can call it quantum uh, error detection protocol. In the beginning of the talk, I'll remind you the definition of classical uh, ARQ protocol, define quantum ARQ protocol, and present results on the estimates on the fidelity of quantum uh, ARQ uh, protocol for codes of finite lengths and for the asymptotic case when the length of the quantum code tends to infinity. Uh, so let's start with classical ARQ protocol. It's very simple but still efficient and popular protocol. In this protocol, we pick up some linear code C and transmit through binary symmetric channel code words of this classical code C and on the other end of the channel we are receive vector y, which is sum of transmitted code word c and an error vector e. If h is the parity check, a parity check matrix of our classical code c, then obviously by definition h times c equals zero. So it's very easy for us using this, this property, it's very easy for us to decide whether y is a code vector of the code C or not. We just have to compute syndrome, that is we have to compute H times Y, and if syndrome is not zero, then we say, well, some errors occurred, so please retransmit us the same code word again, or we just can discard the information Y. In any case, if syndrome is not zero, we don't accept Y. But sometimes the error could be so bad that syndrome is zero and at the same time the transmitted code word C and received Y are still different. And this event is called undetected error. And of course we're interested to estimate the probability of this undetected error because it's really bad. We are thinking that everything is fine except Y as a valid transmitted information while actually everything not fine, but vice versa very bad. And uh, it's very easy in the classical case to estimate the probability of undetected error. If we know AI, the distance distribution, or if you'd like, weight distribution of the used classical code C, AI is just the number of code vectors of weight i. In other words, the number of code vectors that have exactly i ones and n minus i zeros. So if we know a i and if the transition probability in the binary symmetric channel is known, then it's almost trivial to show that the probability of undetected error, which is the probability of the joint event that syndrome is zero, and C, the transmitted code word, and the received vector Y are different, equals this expression. Again, this is the function of the weight distribution or distance distribution of the use code C, and the transition probability in the binary symmetric channel. And what confuses me about this, that if you make simple analysis of this expression, then you will see that you can use any code any good code C of any rate uh, smaller than one, but as close to one as you wish. It could be 0 0.9, it could be 0 0.99, it could be 0 0.9999. As soon as you make the code lengths sufficiently long, you will obtain this probability, the probability of undetected error as small as you wish, which is misleading because it looks like that we can use any code of rate as close to one as possible. And one is the maximum possible rate. So I suggest, I suggested to myself to consider a different probability. I suggested to consider the probability that C doesn't equals Y under the condition that syndrome is zero. And this probability makes more sense from my point of view because what it means <coughs> is the following, that if I received Y computed syndrome and see that syndrome is zero, under that condition, I would like to know uh, the chances that 
y is not the same as c. So if the syndrome is zero, I would like to know how it's probable that if I, uh, if I assume that y is transmitted information, what is the probability that I will make an error in this case? And this conditional probability is different from unconditional probability and again can be written down as a function of the distance distribution of my code C and error probability in the binary symmetric channel. The expression is a little bit more complicated. It's a little bit more difficult to analyze, but still manageable. And if you analyze this expression, then you will see that you can take any code as good as you wish, the best possible code, but if rate of this code is greater than this threshold and the length of the code tends to infinity, the conditional probability of undetected error tends to one. Vice versa, if rate is smaller than this threshold, then there exists a linear code such that, sorry, it's not visible, but this probability becomes zero. So it makes, so looking at this result, probably doesn't make sense for me to use codes whose rate is greater than this threshold, which is different from the previous result, which was telling me that I can use codes of any, of any rate. So I would like to investigate uh, this type of probability uh, for the quantum case. So I switch to the quantum a scenario. In all the talk, I assume that all vectors that appear have unit norm and to keep, not <coughs> keep notation short, I will omit all uh, normalization factors. Okay, uh, again, instead of binary symmetric channel, we'll use a depolarizing channel, and I'm pretty sure everybody in this audience knows very well depolarizing channel. Let me just remind you that weight of error operator in depolarizing channel is the number of factors in this product that are not identity. Okay, now quantum IRQ protocol, very simple. We have quantum code Q and we, <laughs> and we assume that we transmit random and uniformly chosen state W from this code Q and depolarizing channel corrupts the transmitted state and we receive the state E times W. Instead of making error correction, which is a complicated procedure, we can decide to make just one measurement. So let's make measurement with respect to uh, code space Q and its orthogonal complement uh, Q perp. So there are two possible outcomes, obviously. If the result of the measurement belongs to Q perp, then we say, like in the classical case when syndrome is not zero, we say, well, sorry, we failed. Please retransmit us the same quantum information again, or we just can discard uh, the, what we received from the channel. But if we are lucky and the result of the measurement belongs to Q, then typically V and W could be different. And I don't assume that Q is a stabilizer code. Q is any quantum code. So in this situation, I am curious, how close V, the received state after the measurement, and the original state W. So I'm interested in the quantity, which I call fidelity, which is defined as the average, average sorry, or expected value of the square of the inner product of vector V and W under condition that uh, in the result of the measurement of EW with respect to Q and to Q orthogonal, uh, that the result of the measurement belongs to the code space Q. So I would like to estimate this quantity. To estimate this quantity, it's very useful to, to remind ourselves uh, the definition of quantum enumerators. They were introduced by Shore and Laflamme. So if I have quantum code Q, whose dimension is capital K, and P is the orthogonal projector, on the space Q, then uh, enumerators bi and bi perp are defined in this formal way. They depends on the orthogonal, they completely defined by the orthogonal projector operator P on the quantum code Q. 
These enumerators have very many nice properties. Uh, in particular, they are connected by McWilliams identity. That is, if I know bi perps, I can compute bi's as the linear combinations of bi perps. Uh, bi perps are always greater or equal than bi, and bi are always non-negative. Uh, the dimension of quantum code Q is a scaled uh, uh, sum of bi perps and the minimum distance of quantum code, also defined by quantum enumerators, is the smallest integer d such that bd perp is greater, strictly greater than bd. So you see that those enumerators contain a lot of information about uh, quantum code. For, and for many codes, the enumerators are known that can be estimated. For example, uh, for the Steen code that encodes one qubit into seven qubits, enumerators uh, are these ones. Okay, so now I would like to present the first result is about how to estimate the fidelity in quantum IRQ protocol. The fidelity equals this expression. And this expression is very easy to obtain. It's basically by the definition of Foy Neumann measurement. But it's not very useful. Uh, it's much more useful to observe that this quantity is exactly the same as this quantity. Here again, let me remind key, k sorry, is the dimension of my quantum code. P, which is used in this expression, is orthogonal projector on Q. And bi and bi perp are quantum enumerators of the code. Q that I'm using. Let me say a couple of words how this uh, expression is obtained very briefly. So I would like to switch from this expression to this one. Uh, it's almost straightforwardly follows from representation theory that integral that runs over uh, unit vectors uh, W from any subspace Q equals the projector operator on that subspace Q times normalization, <laughs> normalization factor one over the dimension of this subspace Q. Now let me take, now let me take the denominator, integral from the denominator, this one. Now I put trace over here, make cyclic permutation under the trace, put trace outside of the integral, and replace this integral by this quantity using this lemma, so I obtain this quantity and let me remind the definition of bi perps, it's exactly this value. So for this reason, bi perps appear in the denominator. The same story, a little bit maybe more complicated, is valid for a numerator. Okay, fine. Now I have uh, expression for fidelity. So if I have a quantum code for which I know quantum enumerators, I can compute fidelity explicitly. And I also can bound numerically for codes of finite lengths, I can bound this quantity numerically. It's not very convenient to bound it because function is not linear on bi and bi pure, but still it's doable. And it's interesting to consider some example. For example, I can take Steen code, again, the code that encodes one qubit into seven qubits, and to construct upper bound on the fidelity as the function of the probability of error in my quantum channel, quantum depolarizing channel, lower bound, and the exact value for the, for, of the fidelity for, uh, for the Steen code. And surprisingly, at least for me, the Steen code is very close to the lower bound. So from the fidelity point of view, it's not so great code. Okay, uh, it's also interesting that to note that the probability that EW in the result of the measurement will be projected to Q is also function of a quantum enumerator, very simple expression, and actually very simple to prove it. Uh, so the function that V will belongs to Q equals this expression, and, uh, and so we can consider the fidelity as a function that the projection will be done to the Q. So we can consider sort of trade-off between fidelity and the probability that EW will be projected to Q. Let me give one example. So let's take C1, optimal code that encodes one qubit into five qubits. During these two days, people were speaking a lot about this code. I don't present it explicitly here. And let me take some silly code, 
with this to generate the matrix, but also the code that encodes one qubit into, uh, into five qubits. And of course, C2 is far away not optimal code. And let me compute the fidelity for C1, fidelity for C2, and probability for C1 that the projection will be done to Q, and the same probability for the case if I'm using the code C2, and results are the following. Uh, this is the upper bound for the fidelity for any code that encodes one qubit into five qubits. This is the lower bound, and this is the fidelity for the code C1. It's very great fidelity. It's not exactly one, it's something like 0 0.999, but the probability that the result of the measurement will belong to Q is not so large, so probably I'll have to make several transmissions or experiments before the result of the measurement will belong to uh, code space Q. And code C2 has not so good fidelity, significantly lower, but at the same time larger probability that the result of the measurement will be done to the subspace Q. And after that, it's up to you, up to, for somebody who needs a quantum code, to decide what is more important, the fidelity or the chance that projection uh, will, be, the result of the, of the measurement will belong to the quantum code Q. Uh, and second result in is a symptotic case. So uh, let me consider all possible quantum codes whose rate is R. So I consider all possible quantum codes whose rate is R and pick up the code that has largest fidelity. So I start to use notation F R of Q. So instead of Q of some particular code, I write the rate of, uh, of a code that I'm interested in. And uh, again, I would like to, to uh, upper bound, sorry, uh, upper bound this quantity uh, in the case when length of the code tends to infinity, so I would like to find the value for the fidelity for the, for the best possible code, and the answer is the following, that if the rate of quantum code is greater than this threshold that depends on the probability of error in my quantum depolarizing channel, then it doesn't matter which code I'm using, the fidelity will go to zero. That is, the result of the measurement and the original vector will be almost always orthogonal to each other. At the same time, is the rate of the code is smaller than the same threshold, then I can find a stabilizer code such that the fidelity of that stabilizer code would be one. So we observe the threshold behavior similar to behavior which we observed in the classical, in the classical case. Moreover, I can uh, find the rate with which the fidelity goes to zero if, as a function of the length of the code, if the rate of the code, of the, of the quantum code is larger than this threshold. So the fidelity, let me write down fidelity in the exponential form. This is the exponent. And I can prove that if the rate is greater than this threshold, then exponent equals this quantity. So as, as the length of the codes would go greater, greater, and greater, this quantity is positive, uh, the fidelity will go exponentially fast to the zero. Uh, let me say just one word about how existence bound is obtained. It's trivial. Uh, we already have a ready result that says that uh, if we take a random stabilizer code, then quantum enumerators for that stabilizer code can be upper bounded by these binomial distributions. And so it's very easy just to take these quantities and substitute into this expression and to find the limit. Yeah. Uh, upper bound, I don't have definitely time today to, to explain how upper bound on the fidelity is obtained. It's more tedious. And so let me finish my talk at this moment. Thank you. I don't hear, please. Okay. So do you think that the uh, threshold for 
Oh, sorry, I still didn't understand. Can you retranslate for Croatia for me? You have the poly errors, PI, PX, PY. Okay. Yeah. The yeah. question is whether the total probability of error is a half, is the threshold for when this works. No, yes, 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 right. yes. The maximum, the maximum. Yes, yes, exactly. I, it was on the slide. That, uh, the, the, that's, uh, if the uh, probability is greater than one half of error, then it doesn't matter which rate of the code you use, it doesn't work. Right. It's, the, it's the total probability, uh, not the maximum probability. Uh, uh, I, I didn't do that. I was thinking more general. Okay. Well, well yeah. Yeah, let's discuss it after that. Okay, the, my answer is that the presented results are only for the case when P, the P is the probability in the depolarizing channel, is less than one half. If the probability is greater than one half, then nothing is working without, without my results. It's already, already doesn't work. Okay. And if I didn't answer, sorry, I will answer you after the talk.